Hello, everyone. So today's topic is the Delta variant. Uh, we're going to talk in general terms and very specific terms. And one of the things that I wanted to focus on was what to do about it, not just what it is, but what to do about it. And, uh, and there are a lot of very, very good things we can do about either getting sick, getting sick in a safe setting, and understanding that you really cannot run away from viruses, bacteria, fungi, and so on. You cannot run away from these things. And so, uh, uh, let me go to the speaker view. Okay, um, and feel free to interrupt me. Uh, what happened a couple of years ago was the coronavirus. Coronavirus um, scare, the, the virus has been mutating several times. So the Delta variant is not anything new or different. It's just yet another mutation of the coronavirus. So the one thing we need to remember is not everything is as it seems. Not everything that the governments are telling us, that our doctors are telling us, that the hospitals are doing is as it should be. In fact, there's a lot of corruption. There's a lot of deceit. And our group, we need to take care of ourselves. That is the main thing. And so I just wanted to say the coronavirus has mutated literally 32,000 times and we have mutations every day. So to call something a Delta variant or Epsilon variant, no one is testing. People are just saying, oh, that's the new thing. And guess where the new thing is happening? It's happening across the board. It's happening in vaccinated people and it's happening in unvaccinated people. The Delta variant or the new infection, whatever it is, is more virulent, but less fatal. So you don't have to worry about it. It's like a, whereas coronavirus was like a bad flu, this is like a less bad flu, but you can easily get it. And so I, I'm gonna give you a few recommendations today. And we're gonna start with a few things here. One of which is reading about something that was written in 1939 in the homeopathic world. And this, this kind of expresses what our club is about, what we are about. And I'm gonna get this out of the way so I can read it. The human body was meant to resist disease germs. We need not defend ourselves against their attacks by noxious antiseptics and by injecting more or less foul and dangerous disease matter into our whole, wholesome bodies. And the, the point here is we have coexisted with bacteria, viruses, pathogens, friendly guys for millennia, for millions of years. The second you attack them with whether it's antifungals, antibiotics, vaccines, chemotherapy, radiation, antiseptics, you're doing yourself much more harm than you're doing to the bugs. So you, Shuma, where, yeah. are you, where are you quoting from? Where is this, what's the source of this information? Oh, the source of this information is a, a journal article in the homeopathic world in 1939, close to a hundred years ago. Thank How you. to cure the sick, some general considerations. Thank you. The creator made us resistance, resistant to disease. We are naturally resistant to disease, folks. The body fluids are natural disinfectants. The tears in the eye, the saliva of the mouth, the gastric juice, and all the other body fluids are germicidal. Let them be. Invoke these fluids in your body. Internal wounds heal with surprising rapidity without any disinfectant being used. The air which we breathe is most wonderfully warmed and cleansed by an extraordinary arrangement of the nose. Our air contains 20% oxygen, which needs to go down to 2%. And the nasal apparatus helps us start the process, which is why you breathe through your nose. The blood is germicidal. A wound is most efficiently cleansed, cleaned, when the blood gushes out. Get this, when the blood gushes out, it washes out the body, out of the body, the harmful organisms, while outer applications, all your iodine, antiseptics, lotions, and potions may wash those organisms back into our bodies. 
you comp comprehend. If we wish to cure the sick, we must before all have some confidence in the forces of nature and in the power of our body to resist disease. And when we panic, when we hear CNN news, we sort of stop thinking. We stop thinking about our body as the most wonderful fortress of disease control. We don't have trust and faith in our body. And therefore we resort to things on the outside that are actually a lot more toxic than our body's defense system. They don't cure, they are fatal in many cases. So if we wish to cure the sick, we must before all have some confidence in the forces of nature in the power of our body to resist disease. Remember, when you have disease, your body is telling you a message. It's telling you what it needs to cure that disease. And that cure is to fortify the vital force of the body with beet kvass, with ferments, with friendly bacteria that take away or uh, engulf the pathogenic bacteria and viruses with fresh air by grounding, by standing literally on the grass every single day for 10, 20, half an hour, two hours, five hours. We're experiencing fresh air every day. We're getting out in the sun. As soon as disease germs get enter the body, the body fights the invader. So they did not know much about the immune system back then, but for millions of years, we've known about it intuitively, inherently in our hearts. If a wound caused by a thorn or a cut becomes septic, there is at the critical point of swelling with heat throbbing and possibly pus appears. So we think of these things as bad. We're trying to kill the pus. We're trying to kill the heat. We're trying to kill the throbbing. We're trying to kill the very things that our body is trying to use to kill that pathogen or, or take that thorn out. Nature endeavors to destroy the disease germs about the wound by boiling them to death, by producing a high temperature. In addition, white corpuscles, which destroy disease germs, stream from all parts of the body. They knew enough science back then. Um, to the point where invasion by disease germs has taken place. In due course, the fight is settled as a rule in favor of the body. If there's more generalized infection, then the body produces a general fever, again, pyrexia, hyper, hyper temperatures kill, your tumor necrotic factor goes up by many, many times. Your cytokines increase, your white blood cells increase as your body temperature goes up. Don't kill your body temperature with paracetamol. Uh, and in addition, the body produces the indicated antidote with which to fight measles, carlatine, or whatever the name of the others. People who recover from an attack of an infectious disease can supply valuable material to those who have been freshly attacked by the same disease. Those who wish to cure the sick must realize in the first place, and I'll talk about the, what they supply to those who have been freshly attacked by the same disease. They're not talking about vaccinations. They're talking about homeopathic nosodes, where you take the disease part of a serum of a blood of a diseased person you dilute it to the point where there's nothing left and you dynamize it and you give it to the person who does not have the disease and they get protection. That's called homeoprophylaxis. And that has helped millions of people without putting their life in danger the way our mRNA vaccines have today. Okay, if there's a more generalized infection, the body produces a general fever. Again, with the object of killing the disease germs. And in addition, the body produces the indicated antidote with which to fight measles, carlatina, whatever the name of the disease. Those folks are the antibodies down the road. Here we use materials drawn from a body which has been attacked by the disease to fight the same disease and the others, and that's no source. Those who wish to cure the sick must realize in the first place that our bodies offer a powerful resistance to disease. And I'm gonna say this, whether you're 20 years old or 30 or 90 or 100, your body offers the most powerful disease, resistance to disease. Your body offers the most intelligent way to deal with any problem that occurs to it. 
and that the majority of the disease germs are not very dangerous. Let them ride, let them go through your system. That's how you develop immunity. If one takes a swab from a healthy average mouth, one may find that the mouth is inhabited by millions of disease germs, such as the germs of tuberculosis, pneumonia, yada, yada, yada. These germs, disease germs are used as food by the healthy body, and it is of advantage that the body learns how to deal with disease germs. We folks have been living in bubbles of our own making for the last couple of years. We need to get out to develop our immune system and to let our immune system handle anything that comes our way. Because what is life about if not enjoying every moment, if not doing the things that you love to do without a mask, without fear? Children and animals brought up in surroundings where the most scrupulous sanitation prevails, where disease germs rarely enter, become delicate, and they readily go down after a comparatively trivial infection. What is happening today is we've come out of a cave, a one and a half year long cave, and we're finally commingling with people. People have been vaccinated because they think vaccination protects them. They go out and they promptly get sick. The reason they're getting sick is their immune system has not been challenged with germs, with viruses, with bacteria, with environmental toxins in the course of everyday life. And when that happens, your body becomes weaker. So you need to reintroduce it to sunshine, walks, hugs, other people's saliva, other people's sweat, um, touch, dogs, babies, extensively so that your immune system becomes resistant to those things. Children and animals brought up in surroundings where the most scrupulous sanitation prevails, where disease germs rarely enter, become delicate and readily go down with a comparatively trivial infection. The able prescriber, this is a homeopath, right? Must think in the first place, not of disease germs, which may interest the laboratory men. Anyone can find anything in your saliva but of ordinary commonplace matters, which very likely have caused the disease. You must very carefully inquire into the habits of the patient. If he wishes to treat himself, he must inquire into his own habits. If the patient takes unduly large quantities, of, back then they thought all these things were bad, spices, coffee, tea, alcohol, tobacco, of which they are, caffeine, alcohol, tobacco. Um, and so it's really about health. It's not about disease. Life is about health. And once you address health, disease will take care of itself. Would you not agree that you guys who have been part of this group for years now have been very healthy in general? Nothing's wrong with you. You get sick, you get better. You fall down, you heal. You break your bones, you get better. You're not on Fosamax, you're not on heart meds, you're not on statins, you're not on blood pressure medications. You're doing great. And you folks range in age from, you know, like this Maggie who's 20, 30 something all the way to 94. That's because you've trusted your bodies. A question, Sushima. Mm -hmm. um, I really appreciate and like the theory and what you've been reading and talking to us about. However, part of it seems to be based on what was called or has still is called germ theory. Mm -hmm. And from my reading and so on, uh, germ theory is maybe an anachronism. It's not really there anymore. It's, it's a new way of looking at it. So the wisdom that's there, I think if you, ex I'm wondering if you excise the word germ, if it's still valid or there's some other adaptions that can be made. Um, exactly, exactly. There are germ, germs are a construction of mankind. Right. Bacteria are bad, viruses, no, they're wonderful. 85% of your immune system is those germs, is those bugs. So there's no such thing as germs causing disease. It's your body that gets disease and germs collect at the site of the disease. If you kill the germ, you're not curing the disease. If you buy it, that disease still exists. If you take out a tumor, you've not cured the cancer. You can kill all the cells, uh, but you're also killing your body's own cells. So. Your body is diseased at all times. What you want to understand is when you have an infection, when you get the flu, when you get COVID, when you get this, whatever, Delta, Epsilon, Omega variant, um, which is all 
really made up things for your body's inability to cope with that disease. And what we're going to focus on is make, let your body cope with that disease. It's your terrain, your body that matters. It's not the disease. Great. Um, so now we know that there's things called RNA. Your body is made of genetic material called DNA. And the DNA makes mirror images of something called RNA. And that's what instructs the body to make all the proteins. The RNA makes all the proteins you need, the amino acids and so on. And every single day, you guys, what you eat, what you eat in your food is microscopic RNA that communicates with every cell in your body. So if you're eating lard, okay, the molecules of that lard are talking to your genome that is epigenetics. They're talking to your cell membranes. Your cell membranes are saying, yum, yum, I like that lard. I'm going to make nice membranes around myself from this. And, and that is how your food talks to your body every single day. Uh, the mRNA, there's two RNAs. One is the microRNA, which is 8 to 10 nucleotides or 8 to 10 amino acids. And then there's something called messenger RNA, which is what we're injecting into people willy-nilly in the jab. And that's, you know, 100, 200 uh, amino acids that are injected into your body as messenger RNA, which then go and talk to your DNA and get incorporated backwards, which cause your DNA to make something called the spike protein. And this spike protein is supposed to protect you from coronavirus. But guess what it does instead? You make the spike protein from the RNA that is injected into you, and the spike protein proceeds to play havoc with your immune system. What's happening is your body is mounting an antibody response to the spike protein fragments, which are a bunch of proteins that are also present in many of your organs, your spleen, your ovaries, your placenta, your, your, your pancreas and so on. And when the body produces an inordinate amount of the spike protein, the body thinks it's been attacked by the spike protein and the antibodies mount a response against the spike protein. And while they're doing that, they mount a response against your heart, causing inflammation of the heart. They mount a response against your placenta, causing massive miscarriages amongst women. Uh, they mount. Uh, is yeah. the spike protein then actually the vehicle that's causing the disease for people who are inoculated with a shot? Yes, yes. So basically, the theory is instead of them getting COVID, they're getting a, a very COVID like disease through the spike protein. So instead of the person dying from COVID, they're now gonna die from the spike protein. Mm. The only difference between dying from COVID, the disease, and dying from the spike protein is you can recover. 99.5% of the people out there recover from the COVID disease as if it was a normal flu, just a severe form of a flu, okay? It has none of the mortality of the plague or the Spanish flu or any of the larger epidemics. It has killed less than half percent of the population. It has infected by what we now know to be true, close to a half a billion people and will probably infect everyone on this earth in a more nominal form. What the vaccine is doing is causing a mayhem of death. And I didn't speak about it earlier in the year and I didn't speak that much about it last year because I was thinking individual freedom. But the time has come for us to acknowledge the extreme dangers, the extreme toxicity of the prophylaxis that is being recommended by a very, very corrupt government uh, along with pharmaceuticals. And that is the messenger RNA-based vaccines and then the dead viral vaccines that are used in places like India, Brazil, Russia, and so, so on. Another question, I hope I'm not interrupting the flow too much, but it's an important one for me. Sure. Is the uh, response that is being publicly announced on the media and all the other platforms, 
saying that the people who are unvaccinated, that is, quote, vaccination, that are not getting the shots are more susceptible and are dying at a larger rate than any other group. Is that just manipulation in the media or does that have any kind of basis in fact? That is uh, not just manipulation, it's false news. And as um, Claudia pointed out earlier, I'll walk you through the actual research, what is actually going on on the ground. Uh, the people who are not vaccinated uh, are far more likely to not be hospitalized. The people who already got the COVID have 1% chance of getting other variants of COVID as opposed to the vaccinated people. So in is the Israel study basically, where they're having 10,000 people now, 1,000 a day are coming down with a new variant they claim of the, of the disease. And 99% uh, of these are people vaccinated. 1% of the non-vaccinated people are actually getting the disease. 1% of the non-vaccinated people who already had COVID are actually getting the new variant. So that's false. And we'll go, go through the numbers. Right. The, the point here is RNA is very important. It's very malleable. Every day your body through the food RNA, through so 15% of your RNA is supplied by the microbes in your gut. 15% is supplied by your food to your body. And that's what informs it of disease, health, etc. So the food that you put into your body, guys, is super important. The, the, the microbes you put in are super important. Does the micro RNA come from any other sources? Um, but anything external that you imbibe, anything you get into your gut, whether it be food, whether it be bacteria, whether it's the fungi on your skin, the viruses, all life matter contributes its RNA to your cellular DNA every single moment of your life. And so don't think I'm going to eat this tomorrow, uh, start my diet tomorrow, eat leafy greens tomorrow. Those are your true medicine. Those are your medicine, the bugs that you imbibe. And so with the food that you eat, with the bugs that you eat, the krauts and the kvasas, you are taking medicine every single day. That is about a million times, oh no, a trillion times more powerful than any vaccine, any antibiotic, any steroid, aspirins, paracetamols, which not only don't help, they actually harm. They harm because they suppress your body's innate uh, immune system. Any other questions? Thank you. So with that, up until now, about 2 billion doses of vaccine of the vaccine have been given out to people. The population of our world is around 7 billion. So, you know, 2 billion vaccine doses, that means about 1 billion people have been inoculated. There is no end of this, uh, the set of this in, uh, infections in sight. Um, the, the diseases continue to happen. Uh, they're calling it a Delta variant. It could very well be that those people are getting COVID again, exactly the same thing that they got before because the vaccines don't work. The vaccines have never claimed to do not prevent infection. They do not prevent transmission. So one of the things that's happening is vaccinated people are going out into the world. They're carriers of a lot of these, you know, pathogenic viruses or fungi or bacteria. And, and they're not, they're giving it to others who are not sick. And now as soon as they got out of their homes with the vaccines, they'll become nodes of disease. And so while you have this barrage of messaging, oh, the vaccines work, oh, disease and mortality is down, et cetera, those are false narratives because the vaccine was never a vaccine that prevented either transmission or infection. All it does is it produces COVID-like symptoms in your body to which you make antibodies. And what they've found is after that, if you get COVID, it's a very, very, very severe disease. People are dying from that. So COVID after a vaccine causes a cytokine storm in your body where the body just goes haywire and dies. 
So my recommendation to you is people are going to come door to door. People are going to um, pressure you uh, in senior citizen groups, your gardening club, your card playing club. club. Do not succumb to the pressure. Please do not get vaccinated with the boosters or additional vaccines which are coming down the pipe. Uh, they, they're without exception deadly. And I'll go, go through the deadly part very soon. I, maybe this is on the transition point. I've asked the question before it has to do with shedding. With more people getting uh, the shot and developing, not exokines, but are developing the spike protein, are they shedding? Is it more at risk for people who are not get receiving the shot to be among people who are? Yes. The short answer is yes. I am seeing clients who have been shedded on who've got bruising, a lot of bruising, menstrual difficulties, young people, they're getting periods every 10, 15 days, heavy bleeding with clotting, hemorrhage, COVID toes, they're getting um, uh, capillaries bursting in their toes uh, from exposure to people who have been vaccinated. That having been said, while the spike protein may be shed on those people through the air they breathe or skin to skin contact, it is still not injected and your body is better able to handle something that goes in through its senses that are meant to act as gatekeepers than an injection. Remember, an injection is bypassing your immune system. When someone is shedding on you, you're inhaling it. Your skin gets the spike protein. Your body's much more able to deal with it. And I would say the, the shedding seems to decrease at around one or two months. So if, if you're meeting people a month or two after they've been vaccinated, you should be safe. But if you're pregnant, I would recommend avoiding contact um, because it attacks the placenta and the miscarriage rate has gone through the roof amongst uh, vaccinated women and amongst women who are living with someone who was vaccinated. Let me carry this part, my thought, step further. You encouraged me a few minutes ago to go out and mingle and mix with people and dogs and saliva and sweat and all that kind of stuff. Are we not, is that a prophylactic treatment to people who are shedding or is, is there some other thing that we get minor amounts of things because of that? Yes, that's a very, very good question. I made the decision uh, based on my health and immune system to go out and hug everyone I could because I was already doing that before because I already had COVID. Um, I was already sick and better. Um, so that was my decision. With others, you have to make that decision. And it all depends uh, on how unwell you are, what state your immune system is in. Um, my bias would be to, for you to not take huge risks but carry on with the life you were carrying on before COVID hit because that was the social, emotional, physical contact that you needed and that you need to thrive. Because remember, we're not made of substance. We're made of vital energy. Yes. And, and our vital energy was suppressed in the last couple of years. So whatever gives you back that vital energy is worth everything you do. And I guarantee you, you will not die from spike protein exposure, but you will die from the, the vaccine, uh, much more likely to die from the vaccine than spike protein that you inhale from your neighbor. Great, thank you. May, may I ask a question? Yes, please. Um, I, many of the doctors that we've been listening to that we trust say that it's not a respiratory disease. Mm -hmm. However, now, Everything on the news is talking about the Delta being, you know, uh, very, um, not volatile, but, you know, respiratory disease. Mm -hmm. Which is it? <laughs> oh, well, COVID, this particular illness has never been respiratory. However, it affects the lungs. The reason they call it respiratory is because um, oxygen does not attach to your red blood cells. Oxygen is unable to attach. And that's how you get hypoxia. Hypoxia means no oxygen. People assume hypoxia, no oxygen means the lungs are not working. It's not the lungs, it's your blood. Hey, that's what I understood. Yeah. Why are they still saying 
it's a respiratory disease and they have to put them on a ventilator, which I, (laughs) yes. Yeah. That is, that is foolishness beyond compare. And that is what has Mm -hmm. caused the death of the first wave of Americans who are all intubated and ventilators. Their lungs are perfectly clean. They did not need to breathe in more air. It was the air was not detaching oxygen in their blood. And so what they needed was remedies for carbon monoxide poisoning, say, or, or you know, when the air is rare up in mountaintops, those kinds of mm-hmm. remedies. So yes. things that help you. And the, and the steroids did that. They saved these people, but they were intubated and killed. Yeah. So that continues yeah. to be the case. Very good. Quote. Thank you. Thank yeah. you. All right. So two Thank billion. Anyone else? Yep. Yeah, I have one. I need to have one. With okay. the, on the media reports of the increase with the Delta virus or anything else they want to call it, uh, in certain countries in the United States, in Brazil, in Japan, in you know, many India, many places in the world. Does that mean that more people are being susceptible to something or is it just the reporting that's being uh, misquoted? Uh, So so let me tell you about the genesis of the Delta virus. January 16th of 2021, January 16th of this year, India rolled out its vaccine program in all the major cities of India. Within the week, within the week, this virulent illness engulfed the entire nation. The death rate in India was 138 people per million to 1,500 in the US because people were using homeopathy, steroids, um, ivermectin, all these were legal and allowed. As soon as the vaccine program started, they squashed all those uh, treatments and what emerged was a bigger monster. So so the Mm -hmm. Indian vaccine is very different than the mRNA vaccine here. It is simply a regular vaccine where they've taken viral cells, which is, you know, cells from various animals. They've taken pus from a person who died in China and they have inoculated the cells of that pus on those cells and they're injecting that crap into people. So Lord knows what viruses and bacteria are floating in that vaccine. Plus it was stored at um, fridge, te- supposed to be stored at fridge temperatures you know what things are in India, right? Things break down, there's no electricity. So they're shooting up these vaccines with probably all sorts of life creatures in them into bodies so that these people who are vaccinated went out and exposed the entire nation to virulent, Mm -hmm. to additional viruses and pathogenic infections in addition to coming out of their immunity hole. So now people have come out of their holes thinking they're safe They've come out and gotten vaccinated. The original virus, if there was a virus, got modified and mutated. And the the vaccine itself uh, rushed out to to market, defective, contained all sorts of other agents that have caused this massive infection. So it's one measure after another measure after another measure that has led to just disease after disease after disease. And now we have this mutation, which we're calling the Delta variation, for all we know, it could be the alpha or the omega because it's just a piece of RNA, a bunch of amino acid that keep changing. If you suppress that particular amino acid, it's gonna mutate and make it morphed so that it can attack the body or it can infect in another way. Same thing in Brazil. Um, and so now we're, now you're getting the public message, oh, the vaccine worked and now we need a booster. Then we'll need another booster and then we'll need <laughs> another booster. And mm-hmm. guess what? People will continue to die. What we were not counting, what we're not counting is the people that have died from the vaccine. And I'll walk through the numbers. Mm. The reports they say of the people dying in particular locales, I think in the United States, is almost exclusively people who have not received the shot. Is that total lie or what is that? Yes, yes. The reports of people who have died from the vaccine are in the VAERS report, the Vaccine Adverse Injury Reporting System, and they're underreporting by a factor of one to 1,000. So by my reckoning, about 12 million people. So they have put out about 
300 million doses in the US. So 150 million people have been vaccinated. By my reckoning, 12 million people have died from the vaccine, whereas 600,000 have died from the disease, from COVID. Mm -hmm. That is 20 times, six to the 12, yeah, six yeah. 20 times. It's very interesting. Yes. Uh, so types of coronavirus vaccines, and this is, you know, you may or may not be interested, but there's the protein-based vaccine, there's the viral vector, there's the mRNA. So the protein-based is where they just take, uh, uh, the, literally they're taking the pus from the Wuhan Chinese person disease, um, assuming a certain protein is the spike protein, they're cloning that protein, and that where you see it over here, can you see my arrow? Yes. They are cloning that protein. They're injecting it into the body. The body produces antibodies to that protein. And the thinking is that's how it'll get protected. The problem is <clears throat> when you make a protein like that, it has to may be made in live media. When something is made in live media, there's all sorts of contamination. The second thing that's going in is something called an adjuvant which is aluminum salts. And these aluminum salts are used to goose up to kick your immune system into gear. And <clears throat> these in and of themselves are very, very toxic. So um, there are Novavax is a spike protein in nanoparticle vaccine. <clears throat> Any question on the spike protein vaccines? Um, no. no question. The second type of vaccine is a spike protein gene which gets purified. So here you're just taking, harvesting a spike protein from a culture and injecting it along with an adjuvant into the human deltoid muscle, and that raises a reaction. The second type of pro pro vaccine is a protein gene, the spike protein gene, which you snip off from this Wuhan victim's pus stick it into the, a, a, a cell of a monkey kidney or some other animal or a chimpanzee, and you replicate that, those kidney cells so that the, there's a lot of these cells containing a lot of this gene that codes for the spike protein, and you inject those dead viruses into the body Right? And so this RNA goes into the body's RNA, gets picked up by the RNA, and the body produces a reaction to that. That's the COVA shield, the chimp virus, the Sputnik, which is a human adenovirus, the Johnson & Johnson. These are all the vaccines that make blood clots. Actually, I take that back. Every vaccine causes blood clots, but these more so than most. So question carrying on in the middle of this, um, if the, is the RNA is injected from whether it's monkey kidneys or the bovine source or who knows what, and it goes into the body, does that then affect the human DNA? Yes, it does affect the human DNA. These are viruses that are, that are being injected, although they claim that they're killed viruses. You know what happens at six to seven days? It's like refrigerator temperatures, electricity losses um, all over the world, which is not does not have the kind of refrigeration facilities that we do in the US, um, and just the contamination. In addition, they're also adding aluminum hydroxide. So remember, we did a talk on microphagic myofasciitis way back when, I yeah. think four or five years ago. The aluminum aggregates into your macrophages. It does not, the body doesn't know how to get rid of that cell which has eaten up all your aluminum crystals. And so the macrophages stay in your body. They travel through your lymphatic system into your brain. They kill off your brain cells. They paralyze you. And that is macrophagic myofasciitis. Happened after the Gardasil vaccine in Europe. Mm. People were getting paralyzed by the thousands and they discovered these aluminum aggregates. So both these vaccines contain these aluminum aggregates, the spike protein pure, the protein, as well as the adenoviral vaccine. Mm. 
But there's a lot of contaminants. The third is the latest experiment, which is the mRNA vaccine, which is probably the most dangerous technology ever deployed by mankind. And I will, I will go through other attempts that we've made to make these spike protein vaccines. So then you take the, um, from this Wuhan person's pus cells, you take some of these cells and you take the mRNA that codes for the spike protein. You put that mRNA into a soup of E. coli bacteria in giant vats, inject it into their DNA, and they make DNA which incorporates the ability to make these spike proteins and th things called plasmids. And so they just harvest and harvest and harvest this E. coli and then they burst or lyse these cells, collect the little plasmids which contain this. So it all sounds very Star Trek. It sounds very fancy, but a lot of very poisonous compounds, um, beta propiolactone, uh, uh, propylene glycol, nanoparticles of fats that cross your blood brain barrier, your gut blood barrier, uh, are used to um, encase these RNAs. Uh, are used in this process. So this mRNA is made uh, in a soup of E. coli. Then they are harvested in little uh, threads. Think of these as little threads that are harvested into a little grocery bag. The grocery bag is taken over to Pfizer's um, Andover facility and there it is cloned to produce the spike protein RNA. When, when you say clone, does it actually mean that chemically they adapt it or change the structure, mimicking as much as they can electronically what's actually there? Uh, they make copies of this RNA, basically okay. they make copies. And yeah. copies are placed at minus 70 degrees Fahrenheit, or is it Fahrenheit or Celsius? I think it's Fahrenheit, minus 70 degrees very, very cold, inactivated. I mean, so they're, they're, they're very, very cold. And then they're injected into the human body as RNA, mRNA. This mRNA, your body thinks, is something that it can pick up into itself. So it's picking up the mRNA and it causes the body to make massive amounts of the spike protein. And the spike protein, presumably is what is causing the COVID disease. And so it's setting up cytokine storms in people. If it doesn't kill them first, it's gonna make permanent antibodies in their bodies so that if they were to get a coronavirus infection again, or if they were to get ill again, their reaction would be so exaggerated that they die and many have died. And those are the Pfizer and Moderna mRNA uh, vaccines made in E. coli. Just to clarify some of my understanding, the spike protein is being inserted into the body through whatever the substance is that's being shot into the deltoid or whatever it is, but that doesn't naturally, well, it does occur that I've understood in the human body, but it may be, and is it different form or what's the difference? Uh, yes. So the way it is inserted into the human body is with nanoparticles of fat. Nanoparticles means particles that can travel anywhere in the human body. So this RNA is very delicate. So you don't want it to, it's like an m, &M. You don't want it to melt outside the box. You want it to melt in your mouth. Uh -huh. So the, the cover that they put on the mRNA is this nanoparticle fat nanoparticle that makes it enter into your body everywhere, is able to go everywhere because it's a nanoparticle and can cross barriers. So it's very virulent in that it's able to go to distant places in your body, get into your cells, get through your RNA in your cell into your DNA, and then the DNA changes and is now coding for that spike protein. So now the DNA in your body is making spike protein by the gazillion, and your body is reacting to that by making antibodies. What is the problem? And that's the problem also about passing it on to your children that you who are born from you, right? Because then your DNA gets passed on to them, correct? Exactly. But so now when your body is making spike protein and making antibodies to it, 
Can anyone guess what the problem with those antibodies is? Take a guess. Uh, would, would you ask the question again? I was focusing on something else. Okay, okay. So when you inject the RNA that makes your body make the spike protein, what do you think happens? You know, just think commonsensically. You've injected something that's causing your body to make these arrows, if you will. Lots and lots of arrows coming out of your own body into itself. What's so body has, has makes you, makes it, it makes you more susceptible to, um, to all kinds of disease. Exactly, exactly. It, it also means that the body has to adapt it to dealing with this new, this intrusive factor, <laughs> accept it or delete it, or raise another substance for it. Yes, yes. There's no telling. This is like, it's like creating a firestorm in your body in the, in the hope that something will happen. We don't have a clue and we're only now finding. So the spike protein, it turns out, resembles a lot of the protein strands in our organs, like our spleen, our ovaries, our placenta, our heart, our brain, our meninges. And what's happening when you put these proteins out is your immune system is reacting and saying, whoa, intruder, I need to kill this. And they're making antibodies against that spike protein, but that protein resembles, that protein strand resembles many of your body's organs. So you're right. attacking your own body. Right. So now you have a loop and a loop and a loop. Your body is very confused and it's attacking itself. And that's what's killed, in my view, close to 12 million people who are unrecorded uh, from the vaccine. We have had recorded 600,000 deaths in the US of which I'm gonna say only 6% are real COVID deaths. The rest were hospital errors, intubation, you know, senior citizens that were just exposed and on terrible foods and medicines and or people who were dying already. But this is actually killing real people, healthy people. I know that we may not be getting into political and other theories related to this, but I've read and seen a lot of things about why some groups, Pfizer at all, connected with whomever, the cabals of the world or whatever, are using this to control, to kill, to control whatever we want to call that kind of thing by injecting this into mass numbers of people. Uh, let me put it this way. Two billion doses have been sold. At 10 bucks a pop, that's two, uh, that's $20 billion. Someone has made $20 billion for free. They had no costs. We got the government supported all these costs, paid these companies, no liability. And it's going to be 200 billion by the time it's all done. They have enough goons to hire to kill, get rid of anyone who objects or tries to expose them. With that kind of money, we have no competition, folks. Mm. That's the kind of money that's on the table. And while that is the case, people are going to be chumps. People are going to be the guinea pigs. Protect yourself, your children, your seniors, your pregnant women, your, you know, your friends, your brothers and sisters from what is a, like a holocaust. All right, how is this? As, as an example, this is an inactivated virus vaccine called Sinovac, which is made in China. So what they did was they inactivated this. So they took the pus cells from the Wuhan victim. They inactivated them by putting them in a, another poisonous goop to disable replication. And they use heat, radiation, chemicals, etc. And then they injected uh, this stuff into a human. And presumably, with, along with the aluminum adjuvant, so presumably you had a response or you died or, or something. And then their thinking is for this, we're gonna require booster shots to ensure ongoing protection. Turns out you're gonna need booster shots for everything. And with every booster shot, there's gonna be yet more disease for which there's gonna be more booster shots for which there'll be more disease. Um, so this infected Chinese person's virus was um, grown or replicated on monkey kidney cells, which are kill killed with beta-propiolactone which also gets injected into your body. 
And this goop is mixed with aluminum adjuvant. So can you imagine the toxic mm. sludge that we're injecting into this beautiful human body that has an innate immune system that can fight a million times better than any of these implements. Um, same thing with the, if you want the details of the Pfizer, um, Moderna vaccines, they take the E. coli, they take out the pla DNA plasmids, they're cooked with this um, mRNA at very high pressure, like for 400 PSI, which is, you know, a hundred times a pressure cooker. So they're pushed together along with a lipid of some sort. And the lipids are extremely, extremely toxic. Mm. Um, and they're injected into your body. Uh, it has polyethylene, so antifreeze like things and, and many other, you know, just toxic compounds. So as a question I've never heard the answer to, it's just because of ignorance, I think. Why are monkey kidney cells the chosen vehicle as well as bovine sources and so on? Why, is that just because it's easy to get or it works well or what? That's actually a very, very good question. So scientists or uh, manufacturers are always looking for culture mediums of cells that grow very, very fast because they're trying to do this in a hurry, right? So yeah. if, if a virus cell or if an inactive, if a monkey kidney cell replicates once every two months, they're out of business. So you need something that grows virulently, which is why vaccines cause cancer. What grows virulently? Anyone take a guess? What grows what? virulently in your body? What grows super fast in your body? Cancer cells. Yeah, 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 yeah. And so the most favorite cells to use in vaccines in, in the world are the cancer cells of a very malignant cervical cancer victim called Good. Henrietta Lacks. And her cancer cells grew so fast that they're used in many, many uh, cultures to make vaccines. Mm. Monkey kidney cells grow, re replicate very fast. Um, you know, the baby dog cells, baby caterpillar cells, things that replicate fast are used. Mm. What we're not testing for is the viruses inherent in them. So we made the polio vaccine on the SV4, uh, on the monkey kidney cells, which contain the SV40 virus, which caused cancers and leukemias 40 years down the road amongst the people who took those vaccines. Mm. Now we know that we did not. So that leads me to another side question, perhaps, but why does it take the human body so long to develop the diseases that come from the intrusion of other sources, other substances? Yes, that's a very good question. And here's the answer. The answer is the human body is amazing. The human body is doing everything it can. Uh, Mother Nature is doing everything it can to protect you. It's given you two types of immunity. One is your innate immunity. And, and that is the beauty of nature, the beauty of your body that, that you gotta appreciate. And the best thing guys that you can do is get out of its way. If your body tells you it has a fever, respect it, lay down, let the fever rip through your body because when the fever is happening, your body is attacking what it knows to be a toxin, a pathogen, or whatever it is out there. It's a non-specific general immediate response that your body has to something that is not good for the body. And what the body is doing is it increases the temperature. It is increasing, by increasing the temperature, it's increasing the phagocytes the macrophages, the white blood cells at the scene of the crime, whether it be an infection, whether it be a thorn, whether it be a local boil or pustule or a dog bite or snake bite, your body's sending out things to mop it up, wrap it up. And what you don't wanna do is get in the way of it. The minute you put in outside stuff, like chemicals on your wound, you're actually slowing down the healing process. When there's a wound, your body first sends out a gush of blood, to push out whatever was causing, you know, the, any sepsis. Then it puts out platelets, 
which create a little network and coagulate that wound. Then it puts out pus to where white blood cells congregate to kill any infections. And then it slowly granulates your skin, first the dermis, then the epidermis and so on. And it's doing a fabulous job. The best thing you can do is give it food and rest. So that is your body's innate immune system. Every time you have a cough, every time you vomit, every time you poop, that is your body's garbage carriers. After the war has happened in your body, your body is sending out these garbage bags through your uh, rectum, through your mouth, through sweat, through expectoration, through phlegm, through nasal discharges. Um, you want to eliminate all those and not suppress them. The minute you use paracetamol in a flu, people land in hospitals and the flu turns into pneumonia because you've suppressed the body's immune system. Instead, you wanna give your body bone broth, chicken broth, so it gets amino acids that it needs to make the enzymes uh, for the killer cells, for the phagocytes, so that it has rest, so that you're not spending your time running around, but your body's focusing on getting rid of whatever that is. Your body needs ferments. It needs friendly bacteria to engulf the unfriendly bacteria and kill them. Your bacterial RNA is interacting with your RNA to send helpful symbiotic metabolites to your um, site of disease. So literally, Every chug of beet kvass, every chug, every bite of sauerkraut and yogurt that you take is medicine that is helping you with your innate immunity. When we make and use bone broth, what actually is being derived from the bones that is helping us? Massive amounts of minerals, which are required in making all these immune producing globulins, immunity producing globulins massive amounts of enzymes to eat up the infectious agents, massive amounts of minerals and amino acids that are used to make your proteins are made of amino acids with minerals or metals at various ends. Um, and then fats. So your broths contain fats, minerals, and amino acids. Your ferments contain enzymes, live enzymes that help to, to break down products of, de for, of detoxification. Um, so bugs, enzymes, minerals, amino acids, and fats. When you eat fats, like saturated fats, they prevent replication of pathogens, which have lipid envelopes. So they, the way they work is by gumming up their reproductive ability, like coconut oil, tallow, lard, butter, and prevent that disease from proliferating. So your body has the ability with its cholesterol. Cholesterol is an antibiotic substance. The cholesterol engulfs the, the uh, pathogens. Cholesterol attacks and helps destroy pathogens. Fats help to glom up the reproductive cycles. So that's the sort of thing you want to know and want to give your body. What is it that the animal fats give us that vegetable fats do not? Uh, the fat soluble vitamins. They have vitamins, A, D, K, and E. Plant fats do not have A, D, and K. They only have E. And they have other, like glycosphingolipids, cholesterol, that the plant fats do not have, which are extremely antiviral and antibacterial. So I would say ditch your vegetable oils. Cook with animal fats that are very lightly processed to be well. Great. So that's one part, one arm of your immune system. And the second part is your adaptive immune system. After you've gone through this war, see this picture here? You just were at war, Hiroshima, Nagasaki, everything got bombed out. Now what? Now we have this barren field and we first need to shore it up. But out of this have come a few lessons. And the lessons, folks, are the antibodies. And that's the second part of your immune system which fingerprints whatever it was that caused this big storm to happen. And that fingerprinting system is called your adaptive immunity. You cannot have one without the other. 
and you cannot have the other without the one. Mm -hmm. When you vaccinate, you are trying to raise the fingerprinting system without triggering the innate system. So what's happening is mm -hmm. you have a lot of antibodies to a lot of stuff in your body, but your body cannot eliminate anything because this part of your immune system, the innate immunity becomes suppressed by vaccines. A few minutes ago, you said you can't have one without the other and the other without the one. And I missed what that was referring to. Immune, immune system. Okay. So, so immune, immune system versus, or in addition to, what's the one and what's the other? The and one that, is the innate immune system and the other okay. is the adaptive. Got it. Okay. Thank you. So do you see what vaccines are doing? Yeah. Yeah. They are kicking this adaptive immune system and they're shutting down the immune, innate immune system. That okay. in and of itself is cocking up your system. So what you're finding is children who are over vaccinated have chronic disease. They're allergic to everything because they're making antibodies to every single protein in their body and they don't have the energy to fight it and take it out and dump that garbage out. The bodies don't even know what they're fighting because they have antibodies to everything. They're getting 13 antigens in one shot. I looked at someone's vaccine records. 13 antigens in one shot. Can you imagine the confusion in the body? They're just making random antibodies. Sure. These are the things that are giving you multiple sclerosis. These are the things that are giving you Parkinson's, Alzheimer's, celiac, Crohn's, you know, all sorts of chronic asthma, chronic respiratory disease, asthma, allergies, eczema, because you've got way too many antibodies that don't know what they're doing that are attacking every part of your body. I'm going to ask a question that I think I know the answer to, but I'd like to have your response to it. This seems so clear and understandable. Why is it not more profoundly expressed or understood or shared? Oh, there's no money in it. <laughs> if someone told you to eat food, if your doctor told you to eat uh, ferments, you wouldn't get his 80 bucks a, an hour. If someone told you instead of chemo and radiation to eat drink press juices, that that uh, trigger your, that fortify your innate immune system, which then fortifies your adaptive immune system. Farmers don't have patented royalties. No, you can only pat, um, get royalties on patented medicine. And that's what uh, is gonna be sold. And so the US medical system is in some sense, it's not corrupt in the sense of purposefully corrupt, but whose bread I eat, his song I sing, so if you work for the pharmaceutical, you're not gonna say eating food is good for you. You're gonna say food doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. So it's as simple as that. Mm -hmm. and, and the only answer to that, it's, it's not protesting, it's just education, it's understanding. Mm -hmm. It's mm -hmm. having the emotional fortitude. And folks, that's what this group is about, emotional fortitude, to stand mm -hmm. up, the fortitude to stand up and say, no, I'm not gonna take paracetamol. I'm not gonna take aspirin. I'm not gonna take a vaccine. I'm not gonna take this absolutely horrendous pus that's being injected into my body. I am going to take the chance that my body knows best because it does, it's, it's insanely intelligent. No one can compete with nature. Mm -hmm. Alrighty, and why do I why do we say that? Question. Yes, there's a question. Uh, could you just mention one more time about cholesterol and the benefit? I have a Ralph has a relative in Italy that's uh, about to go on statins because her cholesterol is 200. Oh, well, first <laughs> of wanna, all, I, I want to send her some uh, something that you know um, that's easy for her to. Um, to digest yes and and um will we'll help her yes so folks my cholesterol is probably 250 on a good day and it's wonderful the people who have the highest cholesterol especially women in particular um mm -hmm. uh, and anyone who has high cholesterol after the age of 60 actually lives longer than the people with low cholesterol 
Cholesterol is antiviral, antibacterial, forms 40% of your cell membrane. It gives it integrity. Cholesterol antiviral, is anti bacterial. Bacterial. Yeah, it is all your hormones are made from cholesterol. So without cholesterol, you have no hormones. If you have no hormones, you're not going to be able to cope with stress. You will jump out of the window. You will have anxiety. Mm -hmm. You will have depression. You will have suicide. Um, you will not get pregnant because your sex hormones are made from cholesterol. You will not have libido. You will not have muscle strength if you're on statins because it interferes with your muscle uh, manufacturing. And so what is your heart? Your heart's a muscle. So people in cholesterol mm -hmm. die from heart failure. People from on, high, on uh, statins get like clockwork. They get colon cancer in 10 years. I see so many cases of that. Needed for heart uh, health, huh? Yes, you need cholesterol for better heart health. Mm -hmm. There's also a very direct connection, is there not, with cholesterol in the brain? Is it... Oh, yes, the, yes. The, the what? Yeah, you know, most of your brain, 70% you know, of your body's cholesterol is used in your brain. Without cholesterol, mm. you'll have brain disease, yes. 70%. All right. Good. So in short, she shouldn't... She shouldn't be worried about that number at all. And she's just being lied to by the doctors yes, for her yeah, to take yeah. meds. So yeah. mom, it, mom needs to get that across to her that her 200 yeah. number is okay. Yeah, right, exactly. Actually less than normal. How old is she? Uh, she's probably uh, 50. 56 or... Oh yeah, yeah. her number needs to be... She, it's, it's a, she's a very healthy person who needs to do nothing other than eat lots of fats. Right. She had a she had a forty nine year old sister who did, who was a famous vascular surgeon, and in uh, in Italy, and died, um, probably of um, neglect for herself. You know, she just worked herself to death, but um, it was just very sad. Yeah. So she's probably the most unhealthy young woman, and yet you know she was had all this knowledge. Yeah, doctors are the first to go. Doctors mm -hmm. have more suicides amongst them than any other mm -hmm. profession. Uh, they die very young, a lot of, because they drink their own Kool-Aid. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Sad. Sad. Thank you for that. Yeah. All right. How do we know more people and, and more people are dying every day from the vaccine? You go to the National um, VAERS, Vaccine Adverse Events Reporting System. As of July 9th, there were almost 11,000 people who had been reported dead and half a million cases of adverse events. Adverse events is where you're close to death, you land in hospital, they have to do emergency procedures and so on. Uh, this 10, 000, 11,000 number is actually very understated because we, through FOIA um, releases, we got internal emails in the CDC stating that uh, for vaccine injuries, you expect more than, in this instance, they had expected more than 38,000 deaths within one month of vaccination uh, in these eight countries, but only 33 deaths were reported. So, <laughs> so they make it so difficult to report. They make it such a stigma for hospitals and doctors and families to report. You know, when someone's died, you're not thinking about reporting it in bears. You're thinking grief. And so the vast majority of the deaths here have not been reported, folks. Is it not true that the various reporting is also voluntary? It is voluntary. The vast majority are not reported. It's very difficult to enter. And a lot of times they, they kick them out. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so based on this internal memo between, from Frank Stefano, who is the director of immunization safety and CDC discussing adverse events following immunization, the death rate is actually 1,151 times higher than reported. And this COVID vaccine, we have more deaths reported in VAERS than in any time in the history of mankind. None of the childhood vaccines come close to this, folks. In, in six months, we have 11,000 deaths. It's a carnage reported. That translates, that translates into 11,000 
um, 11,000 deaths times 1,100 is 12,100. 12, so about 12 million people have died. They have not been recorded. They have been unsung in all postmortems. If a person dies one day after a vaccine, guess what they say? It's not caused by the vaccine. Exactly, exactly. No autopsy. If the autopsy is conducted, no, all natural causes. Um, and, and the kinds of things that have been reported in the vaccine deaths are cerebrovascular accident. That means blood leaking into your brain, which is going to happen when these fat particles enter the brain containing mRNA that's going to cause a cytokine storm in your brain. Fatigue, dyspnea, shortness of breath, falling down. So they fall down because they stroked out, break a bone, and when they die, two days after the vaccine, they're saying, oh, they died of broken bone and then stroked mm -hmm. out. Uh, physical health, cerebral hemorrhage, hemiparesis means half body paralyzed. Aphasia, not able to talk. High fevers, pneumonia, low platelet counts, bleeding all over the place. Um, unresponsive myocardial infarctions, abdominal pain, they get, uh, they get uh, digestive reflux-like symptoms, respiratory arrest, migraines, hemorrhagic strokes, vasculitis, cardiac, and this happens up to 75 days after the vaccine. This is not a short term. And we don't know what the long-term effects are at all. Cyanosis, uh, myeloid leukemia, uh, glioblastomas, kidney injuries, liver failure, abortions, spontaneous abortions. Um, so it, it seems to very much to a lot of people like a plot to kill human beings. Doesn't it sound like a plot to kill human beings? Yes. Someone's making money and someone's dying. Call it what you will. And we've known coronavirus vaccines cause huge, huge deaths and are very, very toxic for over two decades now. There was a 2012 study on the SARS coronavirus vaccine that the NAID, that is Fauci's organization, funded for use in humans in April 2012. They did preclinical trials on ferrets um, and cynomolgus monkeys. And this led to immunopathogenic lung disease. The, the monkeys got very sick and the ferrets got very sick. A lot of them died. Uh, they did it with children. Most of the children experienced severe disease with infection that led to high frequency of hospitalizations and death. They yanked it off the market. And what they saw was when you gave people these vaccines, they got something called respiratory syncytial 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 disease, viral disease, 10 times more. Their CD count for, CD4 counts went up. So they had huge cytokine storms their bodies went into hyper responses and they all died. Same thing with dengue vax. They put out dengue vax in Malaysia. That's a SARS vaccine against dengue. All these kids got the dengue and died from dengue shock syndrome at much, much higher levels. Most of these kids would have had minor symptoms of dengue. The vaccinated kids all died and they yanked it off the market. Same thing with feline coronavirus vaccine for feline coronavirus. After the challenge with the feline infections, uh, infectious peritonitis virus, these animals succumbed earlier than the control group, which were not infected, which were not injected with the vaccine, and they all died. They call it early death syndrome, which is. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't know there was such a syndrome. Um, Sushma, cytokines can be measured, can they not, in a body? Yes, those are. <laughs> If they can, then cannot a link be established between what just happened or what happened before? Yes, the links have already been established. The scientists are wonderful. They've done the research. But at the heads of the CDC and government, we have very corrupt people who are pushing vaccines as a way to deal with something where immune system rehabilitation should have been stressed. Mm. We have senior citizens and senior centers being given 12 pills a day, no food, the food is canned fruit and all that. Uh, how do you expect them to live? And then they get vaccines. Of course, they're going to die the next day. Yeah. So the most dangerous places, guys, are public institutions, senior centers, hospitals, 
if you want to live and be well, go to hospitals only in the event uh, you are in an accident and are bleeding internally. They can do trauma centers can do magical and miraculous things, but everything from cancer to chronic disease is actually caused by these very institutions. Yeah, so think of that. Every time you have a vaccine, this is what you're gonna do. Make a firestorm in your body. You'll either die, if you're lucky, you won't die, and you'll get chronic disease. And if you're very, very lucky, and after many years, you'll recover. So, so if I can go back a few steps, you started talking about the Delta variant and what you talked about the number of variants which actually develop. Why is that? Is that kind of for publicity or Delta sounds cool so you can identify it? Or why is that that's the focus? Exactly, exactly. Both. It's for publicity. It is, uh, they, they look at the genomes of, of viruses that have infected people and they say, oh, this spike protein is two amino acids different than that spike protein. We're gonna call it alpha version. This one is gonna be called omega. And this, because the is coronaviruses mutate every 18 hours, folks, you cannot have a vaccine to something that replicates every 18 hours. And so they're constantly mutating. And, and this current wave has occurred because we vaccinated the population, because we kept them hidden away in caves and masks for two years. So their immune system is, is completely unprepared for the onslaught when they come out. So these are not viruses that are per se dangerous. These are viruses or disease that's been created by our prophylaxis. Um, so what happens when you go into this database? I've, I've been sort of it's like I can't stop reading the causes of deaths and the deaths in the various database. And here's a person, 32-year-old um, Massachusetts woman, vaccinated uh, April 9th, the 1st, um, and May 31st, 52 days after the vaccination, she died. She was pregnant. Her death happened during delivery. She had two other prior births. Uh, she received vaccines while pregnant with a third child. Patient has asymptomatic factor V lead, and she delivered on 527, passed away 531. They took the child out by C-section. This is the kind of uh, this is the kind of horrors we're subjecting our human beings to. And when people object, they're being shut down. Their jobs are being taken away. Um, government leaders are pretty much bought by pharmaceuticals. I remember protesting against a mandatory vaccination of children. Uh, there were like 2000 of us that showed up at the Capitol building, but people don't matter. People don't matter. Uh, uh, we are owned by corporations and our only, our only recourse is emotional uh, fortitude and understanding and education and saying, no, even if I have to take my child out of school, I'm not going to uh, subject them to this toxicity. So I have one more to, to add. It keeps things keep coming up. Um, my upstairs neighbor just had a young baby born um, about two and a half, three weeks ago. She was given the shot that she took the shot because she's in education. They also have a two and a half year old. Mm -hmm. Um, she says she doesn't seem to have any symptoms other than a sore arm when she got the shot. So the question is, if there's so many uh, instances of theirs, maybe underreported and all the rest, what happens with the people who are not exhibiting symptoms? Is it too soon or is it something else that's going on? Uh, it could be anything. It could be too soon. Uh, there are women who are breastfeeding their children. Child died 24 hours after the woman was vaccinated. Um, some survive, some don't. But you're playing roulette. Remember, you're playing Russian roulette. Yeah. Uh, these 12 million people who have died, we don't know, uh, you know, what exactly their life circumstances were. What we do know is this need not have happened. If they had had COVID, there was, would have been a very slim chance of them dying. Very, very slim chance. And, okay. and mm -hmm. so here's a real life example. Um, Israel reported May 23rd with great pomp, yay, 
92% of our seniors over 50 are vaccinated. The population overall has a vaccination rate of 61%. And all restrictions will be ended. You can come out and congregate. Guess what happened? That people got sick. <laughs> yeah. uh, while the majority of the population having received the Pfizer vaccine, about the 92% of those 50 and older were inoculated and had recovered. What, what they discovered was that the vaccines, uh, the disease had gone down. There were only 12 new virus cases on Saturday from a high of 10,000 in January. And as soon as they ended restrictions, look what happened. The end of that month, more than 7,700 new cases of the virus detected during the most recent wave starting in May. Only 72 of the confirmed cases were reported in people who were known to have been infected previously with COVID. Meaning of the people who got COVID the disease, almost nobody got the Delta variant. So 99% of the people who got sick from the Delta were people who were vaccinated previously. So, and this is a little fish tank. It's a little experiment because Israel is a small nation. They have one vaccine, which was the Pfizer, which was administered to everybody, two doses. 92% of the senior citizens, people over 50, and within the week, within the week, the new wave started, 77, 1,000 a day are now coming up, and it's probably going to go up to 10,000 again. Only 1% of these were people who previously got the COVID and recovered and were not vaccinated. That is the article that I sent a link to in our chat. Yep, you are absolutely right, my friend. So this information doesn't get publicized even by Israel, who is hoping to set a standard uh, because that would go contrary to what they're, they're planning or that they're proposing. Yep, exactly. They're coming out with vaccine passports now, which, which will make it so you have to take these two plus 20 more shots. Yeah. yeah. Um, so um, enough about talking about what's going on and how bad it is. What do we do about it? And, and you guys are a very special lot. So I would say, number one, continue to do exactly what you're doing. Continue to eat the way you're eating. Continue to go out into the sun, hug your children, your dogs, hang out, eat good food, and understand that you are going to be exposed to it sooner or later. Mm -hmm. You cannot outrun air or nature, or a virus, or a bacterium, or a fungus. It's there everywhere. What you want is exposure in a safe setting. Yeah. What you want is healing rather than fatal medicine. And the reason we went for fatal medicine was pure and simple television. People have the news on, and they work themselves into a frenzy, and they say, I'd rather die from the vaccine than, than get COVID. COVID is not a dangerous or deadly disease most, almost 99 and a half percent of the time. Well, I want to add something that I do. Actually, my daughter Mirabai suggested it, and I've been finding it's a very important part of my day. When I, I go out in the walking Golden Gate Park, which is a wonderful asset, just a, a block from my home. Mm -hmm. And I walk and I say hello to people. I don't actually hug anybody because I don't really know anybody there. <laughs> But they, I'd probably get arrested for that. But what I do do that Mirabai suggested is I hug trees. Yes. That is so satisfying. They have my favorite trees that I do that. And one time a woman stopped and she said, are you okay? <laughs> <laughs> I said, yes, I'm just hugging a tree. It really feels good. Yes, 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 yes. So true, so true. Uh, that's what you got to do, guys. Yeah, bears do that too, Land. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Find something to hug that's connected to the ground. And this is just another graph that says these. See this little uh, line here? These are yeah. the unvaccinated people. They're, that's their hospitalization rate compared to the vaccinated people. 
Mm. They don't go to hospitals, they get well faster, they don't get the Delta virus. And now this is the latest, July 17th. Israel has once again crossed the threshold of diagnosing 1,000 cases in a single day. Yeah. Um, a total of 77, 71,299 corona tested performed. Da da da. Total of 107 patients hospitalized. Um, and so on. So it's, they're back in business. Now they're going to have another booster, which will cause the Omega variant to come up. Um, what if you actually got the vaccines? Like 90% of Marin folks have gotten vaccines. Some are pressured, some are required by their jobs. And say so you did it. What do you do? Homeopathy to the rescue. I have worked with two people now with excellent results who I thought were pretty close to death. One had se se severe cerebral edema, severe headaches, flaming fevers, body aches. And um, I left a can, a thing of Restox 1M Arnica 3C on her porch. She took it within 20 minutes, her headache went away. And she is alive a month mm -hmm. later. So it's awesome. Uh, but here are rubrics you can use because you're now all going to become um, home homeopaths. Vaccination ailments after numbness, upper limbs, lower limbs, numbness in lower limbs, weakness in upper and lower limbs, numbness of the tongue. These are typical acai effects you see, effects you see from the vaccine. Paralysis, um, neurological, cold spots in single part, the diarrhea. Now your body feels like it's on pins and needles or fire. Silica is a, silicia is a great remedy to antidote these effects. Thuya is great. Arsenic amalgam is great. And these are good for spike protein to people too. If you've got the spike from others uh, and you have, if you have these symptoms, consider these remedies. Keep a kit. Tushan, what's the key for the different color boxes? I don't see anything on my screen that tells me what that is. Oh yeah, the darkest boxes are the most potent, the highest grade. Hmm. So the more boxes that a column has, the more fitting that remedy is for that set of conditions. Uh, in this case, Cilicia is a great remedy for vaccine damage if you got the vaccine. Um, this is for both vaccine damage as well as COVID, the illness. If you have joint pain, if you have headache, flu-like symptoms, Restox is a great remedy. Arnica for pain and bruising that's happening to a lot of young women bruising on their legs when they're exposed to spike protein, protein, Arnica. If you have blood clots, Crotulus horridus is great. Arnica is great. If you have cardiac events, Aurum metallicum, Aurum arsenicosum. I had a, a person who, who, was, who had chest pains. Uh, he's on Aurum metallicum and Arnica. So far he's alive. We'll see what happens 30 days from now. I'll report back to you. Black and blue bruises, Arnica, COVID toes, which is the red toes. Portalus horridus is great. Carbovegetabilis, thuya, mercury, wonderful remedies. If you have hypoxia uh, from either the virus or the vaccine, carboveg, aspidosperma. These are great, great homeopathic remedies to have on hand. Could you say again what COVID toes are? I don't understand that. Oh, COVID toes are a phenomenon we're seeing in especially young people or people who are asymptomatic. They didn't have other signs of COVID. They have red toes. Oh. Weird but true. Kind of like chill blades, but it covers your toes, sometimes your feet, sometimes your fingers. Weird, weird, weird. Uh -huh. Okay. Thank you. Um, food. Focus, folks, on health, not disease. And that needs to be a lifelong motto. That's lipids to make your lipid envelopes, your cell membranes, to kill viruses and bacteria, to give you an immune system. You need animal fats. You need animal fats. You need minerals. How do you get minerals out of vegetables? Only with fats. Fats mm -hmm. contain the vitamins that allow you to assimilate the magnesium, the calcium, the phosphorus, the selenium in your vegetables. Never, never, never eat a salad with just acid in it. Put lots of fats, preferably melt butter on it. It's easy, right, to make hollandaise. Melt butter, add an egg yolk, add some lemon juice, pour it on your salad. 
So that means that animal fats only or uniquely for salads? Yeah, um, I would recommend using animal fats, yes. I mean, you could use olive oil, but fats first and foremost, because fats allow you to assimilate minerals. And if you can, fats with animal fats in them. You could mix olive oil with cream cheese and sour cream or heavy cream, and you would get your animal fats along with the greens. Great, thank you. And uh, this is not difficult, it's dead simple. So Carol, you can easily make this. Just, just melt some butter, pour it on your vegetables, pour it on your vegetables. Melt some butter, pour it on your meat. Uh, take some cream, mix it up with, you know, in your sour cream and your smoothie or, you know. And plenty of ghee with your, with your, just to um, saute your vegetables in. There you go. Saute them with five tablespoons of ghee. There you go. Tastes good too. Chilled and a little food. drop of, um, uh, of um, what do you call it? The, the, the dark um, vinegar. Soy. Soy. Balsamic. Oh, yes. So good. A drop <laughs> of balsamic, some fat. Yummy, yummy. Uh, oysters, you need zinc. You need zinc for uh, a lot of immunoglobulins, a lot of enzymes that are needed to fight infections require zinc. What else, what else for zinc besides uh, oysters? Uh, vegetables, lots of vegetables, okay. oysters, uh, shellfish, um, rich in zinc, yes. Um, Ready. Juices, juices that are pressed, cold pressed. Go to Urban Remedy. If you don't have a juicer, go get juices from time to time. Think of this as your medicine budget. Don't spend money on insurance, spend it on food. That's, that's where you're going to get maximum health. You guys will live forever on this kind of food. Uh, blood oxygenation. Beet coas literally increases the oxygen carrying capacity of your blood. Uh, if, uh, raw meat that has been cured. So take a hunk of meat like that. See that beautiful mar marbled piece of meat? Put salt and pepper on it, stick it in the fridge, let it cure, eat it. It's meat with lactofermented bacteria on it, sauerkrauts, beet crowds, pickles, but not things that have been pasteurized or made in vinegar, okay, raw. Master tonic, has everyone We'll, we'll discuss this afterwards to see if everyone has their master tonic. Make it. And, and folks, just remember, uh, you are not made of phosphorus, calcium, and selenium, and amino acids. Uh, you're made of, like, say, Margaret. Margaret, if we replaced all your muscles, they do get replaced every seven years, you would still be you. And that you is not substance. It's not substance. It's your vital force. It's your spirit, your soul. And mm -hmm. that is what guides this mass of substances. And any other mode of thinking is false. You are guided by your vital force. Grief can kill a person. Joy can bring health to a person. So do things that give you joy. Don't do things that, that are unpleasant within reasonable limits. Do things that spark joy in your life and that will heal you, that will heal you. Um, everybody needs to get grounding. Take your shoes and socks off. Your feet have to touch the ground, the ground with a Schumann frequency of eight hertz. You need to lay down, your digestion will improve. You'll get some sun. Dogs get happy in the sun. It's wonderful. Uh, try and get a good night's sleep. Raise your beds six inches from the ground. If you have any kind of reflex, any kind of problems, your circulation will improve. Your cerebrospinal fluid circulation will improve. Blood circulation will improve. Lymphatic circulation will improve. Raise your bed. Get a good night's sleep. And breathe with your nose, not your mouth. Practice yeah. Buteco. Mark I, found, I, found, I found through experiment that if the wind is blowing and I'm outside in the park and I want to strip down a bit to get some sun, that if I lie down on the ground, the wind doesn't seem to be there as much. <laughs> yes, I have that discovered works. that. 
Yes. <laughs> you got to do that. Margaret, feel free to lie down on your front lawn. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Mine's brown now. Yeah. Oh, brown now. Oh, so sad. <laughs> It's very sharp. <laughs> but you will notice that if you ground, you sleep better, folks. So go to a big yeah. and go, just ground, just ground. Uh, hugs, not masks. Hugs, not masks. <laughs> nothing, nothing will kill your immune system faster than masking. Nothing will make you sicker than masking. Uh, masking is bad science. People have not pre prevented disease, rather have contracted disease. You're breathing in carbon dioxide. You're breathing in your own bugs. Nature was not, nature did not mean for us to have masks on. Nature has an immune system for us that's far, vastly superior to anything we could come up with. And hugs are going to give you the vital force, the soul, the spirit, not the substance that you need to survive and thrive. Um, so the bottom line is you can't run from an illness or a virus or a bacterium or a prion or a fungus. Masks don't work, have never worked unless you're in PPE, personal protective equipment, and you know every single molecule and you're wearing shields and such, which is not happening in real life. Vaccines don't work. As a matter of fact, vaccines kill you. You all need to be ex uh, exposed to the virus in a safe setting. We need to hang together as a group. If someone is ill, bring them soup and kvasas and whatnot, help people along. That is the true hospital. That's the true doctrine. Um, you, you will develop greater immunity against variants if you get the actual disease. You'll develop lifetime immunity. For most of us, that is our entire life. They have opined 80% immunity, 80 years of immunity, excuse me. So most of us will be dead long before our immune system goes away. Um, you will have greater resistance to variants if you get the disease. Your symptoms will get better faster. You will have no side effects that knock on. You will not have chronic diseases following on if you obey mother nature's laws and homeopathics. And with the that- The picture says it all. <laughs> that, yeah, the picture says it all. <laughs> yes, exactly. Not with the bees. <laughs> yes, yes. Uh, so thank you, everybody. Now I'll stop sharing and open up for discussions. And we are actually going to talk about what people are doing.